literally, I lost my job, so I literally had to like leave the country. So that was a very kind of stark failure from sort of hero to zero very, very suddenly. I wasn't like that, right? I've been coding since I was nine. I'd done computer science at uni. I was pretty much a techie's techie. Blinks is the company that I actually started. And it was the one that, you know, took us the longest way. And that went from being, you know, a zero dollar business to being a $250 million business. Like, well, what do we do next with our lives? Our job is to, my now firm, Balderton, invest in back believe and you know enable amazing entrepreneurs and founders i mean you know nine years later i i love my job and we're live today we have with us saranga from borderton capital who's a partner there and they've got six billion dollars and assets under management if you're joining us for the first time we're the bay hq i'm Amma, your host if you enjoy this podcast make sure you leave us a five-star review on podcast platforms and subscribe to us on YouTube. So I want to dive in straight away with you. When you're growing up, like, what did you want to be? What were your dreams and ambitions? It's a great question. I, I mean, I think I had lots of different dreams and ambitions, honestly. The one that that really stuck for a long time and, and ended up being relevant was that I really wanted to write software, to write computer programs, and to make a company around that idea. It was a very, I mean, I was young, so it was a very sort of naive, not particularly well thought out, detailed plan, but I just had this sense that this was a thing I enjoyed doing, and that it was a thing you could do to build a company. I don't think I even really fully understood what starting a company was, or why that might be interesting, but it just seemed like you know, a cool thing to do. And in particular, I really wanted to write computer games. That was my mm. big passion at the time, not unusual for, uh, you know, a nine-year-old or whatever. But yeah, that's kind of what where I started and, and, and sort of started taking me on this journey. And you grew up in Sri Lanka as well, right? So I lived there for the first couple of years of my life. And then Sri Lanka, as unfortunately continued to be the case, has gone through a lot of challenges of various sorts, including, of course, a very long civil war. And my parents, both on a very personal level, because my dad was a bit politically active at the time, but also on a sort of just bigger kind of opportunity level just didn't think it was the best place to bring up a young family and so they my dad had done his PhD in the UK earlier gone back to Sri Lanka to try and be a lecturer to teach there but when you know, was struggling with with feeling at home in, in in his home and so they decided to move to the UK when I was two so since then I've pretty much grown up here we lived in a few different places as well on the way but mainly mainly here in Britain and then as you said so you went to university to study to was that still to go onto that path of yeah. building computer games? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was very lucky. My dad brought a computer home from work when I was about eight, nine years old. It was BBC Micro, didn't have any games on it. He sort of promised that he'd buy me and my brother a game if we showed him that we could do something useful with a computer. So basically, that's what gave us the incentive to learn to program. And it was one of those things where once I started to learn to program, that was actually more fun than the game, certainly at the time. So I, I, I just always coded in the background. I wasn't particularly good. I didn't do anything particularly impressive but it was like a sort of hobby. And so when it came to applying for uni, I sort of thought to myself, well, I could do something I'm interested in. I was really interested in economics. I was interested in politics and a few other things. But then I thought, actually, if I did computer science, I reckon I can do a lot of it kind of quite easily because I, I've already done a lot. And that would give me more spare time to do other things as well. So that was kind of the vague thesis that made sense when I was 17 to apply yeah. for, for computer science. So even when you're at university, did you start trying to build out different companies there or different products? Or yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think so, you know, I, I went to college between 97 and 2000. So the dot com boom, basically, it was a really exciting time for someone like me. By this point, I was pretty convinced that I wanted to go into something very commercial and start a company and so on. And, and, you know, it was amazing going to university at that time. I'd read Wired magazine every month and there were just loads and loads of stories um, about, uh, you know, people starting companies, leaving university, becoming millionaires overnight, all this kind of exciting stuff. And so, yes, yeah, so it was a, it was definitely a focus for me. And me and a couple of friends tried our hand at starting a company in, in our final year at university. They actually kept running it for a couple of years after university as well. But, you know, it didn't, didn't really go anywhere in the long run. But, you know, that was the beginning of, of doing it for real. And when you went to actually do it for real, was there any things which maybe didn't quite match up with your wired perspective of yeah. <laughs> you start it, you become a millionaire straight away? Yeah. What were some of the roadblocks that you like? Yeah, sort? that's a great question. I mean, it was very, the first thing I did for university wasn't start a company. So I went and so, you know, I thought, okay, this is really exciting. I need to go learn how to do this a bit. So I went, I ended up joining a US software company. That was amazing. And they were a company that really put a lot of focus on entrepreneurialism and encouraging you to try your own ideas. But unfortunately, they, the dot com crash happened. Uh, within the first few months of me being there. And so they laid me off along with about two thirds of the company. And I was in the US at the time. So I had to literally, I lost my job. So I literally had to like leave the country before the, uh, you know, the immigration services came for me. So, so that was a very kind of stark 
failure from sort of hero to zero very, very suddenly. And then I thought, okay, well, I really need to like find a safe place to sort of rebuild from. And I joined another software company back in the UK at that point. And then that company took me to California. And, and it was really once I went back to San, to the US, to California this time, to San Francisco, that I thought, okay, I'm seeing more and more people doing this sort of thing around me. I can I can do this. Like I'm ready for this. And I was again lucky because actually the, the founder of that business that I was working for was really supportive. And, you know, originally the, the, the thing that became our company started off as an idea and a kind of incubated project within that company. So we had a bit of a safe start. But I think the biggest difference was simply that, you know, I started that project in 2003-ish, 2003, 2004. And by then, you know, there'd been this big economic crash, particularly in tech. And and so this idea that you were going to be overnight success was just gone, you know. Yeah. And I and, and there were times when I'd look back at, you know, the good old days, f- just five, six years earlier, and thought, if only I'd done it then, you know, it would have just, it would have just taken off like that. But on the other hand, the fact that it was a harder journey was worth something because I think, you know, you that builds resilience. It, you know, it means that you get through the tough times. And in the end, I was probably better for it as an entrepreneur, but it, it definitely was slower going and less glamorous uh, than I hoped it would be at first. I guess it's interesting from like your perspective of where you saw that dot com crash, mm. but you still decided you still wanted to continue in the software industry. Yeah. And I guess some people right now maybe think, did I make the right choice by yeah. entering the tech world or have I, yeah. like, was it just like exuberance of, people doing so well and maybe I should have gone yeah. some another route. What kept you in the game despite seeing yeah. all that kind of failure around you? Yeah. So, I mean, look, there's always, whenever you get one of these sort of waves, uh, you know, unkind person might call them bubbles, you get, you know, some people who are at the heart of it and you get others who are attracted to it, of course, right? And you can sort of tell this, that the classic signal in the US is what are the most desirable jobs for MBA graduates from the top MBA schools, places like Harvard and MIT and Columbia and Stanford and so on. And during tech booms, they all want to go to California and they all want to work for Google or a startup or whatever. And then when the tech boom ends, they all want to go to Goldman Sachs and go to New York uh, and wear a suit. And I think there are a lot of people like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's you know, it's good to be to be fluid in sort of defining who you are and what job you want to do. And, you know, if you believe in a capitalist system, part of that is a free flow of talent, right? So talent should go to wherever it's needed, and wherever it's valued. But those sorts of people, I think, you're right, there isn't necessarily a lot of staying power. They were there because it was an interesting opportunistic, profitable place to be. And of course, they're drawn to it. And when things are not going so well, they're less drawn to it. I wasn't like that, right? I've been coding since I was nine. I'd done computer science at uni. I was pretty much a techie's techie. There was a brief period when I was at uni where I did an internship at an investment bank. And in fact, I applied to and got a job offer to be not on the IT side or the tech side, but a a sort of proper banking job as an equity analyst. And, And I decided not to, and I joined that software company instead. And that was really the last moment that I seriously considered something outside tech. So by the time I'd made that choice, I was done. You know, I'm not, I was just going to be a tech person through and through. And I guess I was lucky that I was in San Francisco at the time as well, where although it had changed a lot and a lot of it had depleted compared to a few years earlier, there was still a lot of tech around. I remember on my very, very first trip to California, to, to Northern California, I had a free weekend and I, I drove down the valley uh, on the 101 from the city and then back up again. And I stopped off at a whole bunch of, you know, to me, iconic places, you know, and it was this kind of funny little pr- pilgrimage I went to, the garage where HP started, the garage where Google started, you know, the 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 building where the Yahoo guys first met when they were doing research. I mean, and and like I was really excited by this sort of thing because it was it was big to me, which is a bit tragic really. But but anyway, if you're that kind of person, I think there was no doubt that this is what I was going to do. And then obviously you then went on to build your own companies, right? Yeah. And there was one major success. Well, you had different yeah. successes, but was it Blinks is the one that you really... Yeah, I mean, really, yeah, while I've been involved in various things, Blinks is the company that I actually started myself and, and you know, with my co-founder, Matt. And it was the one that, you know, took us the longest way and was the most interesting journey, for sure. And it was a 10-year journey, right? So a lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of learnings. What was, like, for people who don't know what it is, yeah. what, what did Blinks do and why did you get into that in the first place? Yeah, I mean, it's very non-glamorous and not particularly clever, but basically my co-founder and I are both technical. We both had computer science backgrounds. And so we both came at it. It from a tech point of view. And we took some stuff that we were working on our, uh, our previous employer and said, well, couldn't we build something that was sort of similar, but applied into a new market? So whereas our previous employer had sold what would now be called AI, at the time it was called kind of information retrieval to uh, enterprises, to large businesses, we thought, well, couldn't we build some kind of consumer product? And so we started this company called Blinks. Uh, the name didn't really mean very much at the time. And it was just this 
general concept of, you know, make stuff that lives on your computer more searchable. So you can find the right email, the right document, the right photo, the right video, whenever you want it. And slowly that blossomed. And it turned out the most valuable bit of that was actually the searching of video content, because video is really hard to search because there's no, there's, apart from maybe a title or a file name, there was no other information. And then we discovered that at the time, although people had some video on their laptops or their computers, actually most video that people wanted to watch was out on the internet because it was really exploding at that time. So this is the era where YouTube started, Hulu started, started, iPlayer started, etc. And so then we built a video search engine using the same core tech, but applied in quite a different way. And that was the business model that really worked, powering, you know, video search and video uh, matching and targeting and recommendation, basically, for a variety of different companies. So all kinds of websites that had a lot of video online used us as an underlying tool to basically make that video more manageable. And we would just charge, you know, a tiny fee every time any of those things, any of those transactions occurred. And that went from being, you know, a zero dollar business to being a $250 $250 million business. Um, so, and, and it grew very rapidly. A lot of that was right place, right time. You know, I mean, we, you know, this video thing was just exploding and, and, and a lot of people needed to figure out how to make it work. And we were there. One thing that's interesting for me, like all the people I've interviewed, is that the people who've really made it to the very top, yeah. they're always very open about saying it's right place, right time. Sure. And there's always an element of it, right? Yeah. And I think it's, it takes some kind of level of maturity for people to realize that. Whereas a lot of people might say it's all down to me being amazing. It's yeah. like, <laughs> there's lots of people who are amazing and yeah. incredible at what they do. Yeah. But it's about getting the right product for the right time like you did. Yeah. With you and your co-founder, how did you split your roles as well? What was the aspect that you gravitated towards in mm-hmm. terms of building Blinks Up? So, no, I mean, like I said, Matt and I both technically had a technical background, but he's honestly a better technologist than I am. And so naturally he gravitated towards being the CTO. And so he ran the tech team, built the product, all of that. And CTO doesn't really give him justice. I mean, he he thought about the product. He thought about even the commercialization of the product a lot as well. And my job was to, to do what was left, a bunch of which was very unglamorous. So, you know, setting up offices and, you know, buying chairs and all that kind of stuff. And then some of it was obviously more front facing stuff. So, you know, trying to figure out who our early customers were going to be, raising some money at various points and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I became the CEO. And that was the last time really that I coded until I restarted it a few years ago to help my kids. So so that was like the end of tech from a sort of hands-on perspective for me. And you mentioned how you love tech so much, right? Yeah. So is it difficult for you to get out of the tech side and like admit, okay, Matt's probably better to lead that side than I am? Actually, no. I mean, I was very fortunate. I went to uh, Cambridge University for, to do my computer science degree. And when I went to Cambridge, I did, I did fine, but I, I mean, I met a lot of people who are very, very smart and who are you know, way more academically able than me in a variety of different subjects, including computer science. And I had, by that point, I had absolutely no, you know, aspirations to try and be the best technologist ever. I just didn't think that was where my my, um, you know, my, my sort of real strength was. What I've always really enjoyed is sort of bridging the gap between the technology and everything else outside. I've loved talking about tech. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love the, the idea of products. I love marketing. I love sales. I, I've always enjoyed all of that kind of stuff. I've enjoyed even the sort of teamwork side of it. Like, you know, for me, some people love tech because they can really disappear in an introverted world and just work on their own thing, which is wonderful for, for them. For me, actually, I've always loved being in a team, working on something to build it together and so on. So so, so actually, I naturally gravitated more towards all those bits. So it was actually quite a nice balance between the two of us. And then, you know, later we were joined by other really critical people without whom the journey would have never worked. You know, our CMO, who was amazing and helped us tell the story. Our, we had a great CFO, a great COO and so on as well. So it's all about finding the right people at the right moment in time. Is there anything from that journey as well, which maybe is a hidden innovation, which maybe wasn't very front facing, yeah. but you're really proud of in terms of a problem you had to solve? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we that we did, which um, we even have a patent for, but it's never been enforceable or enforced, but which I now see everywhere, which is that we realized very quickly that, um, and this will seem really obvious to anyone who's like under a certain age, but honestly, like at the time, this was not obvious. When you're doing stuff with video online, then actually, you, you you know, video takes time, right? So if you look at a list of text results, you can very quickly skim read what's going on. And you kind of know what you're looking for. Video, unless there's, if there's no description, you have no idea what's in the video. And so we built this really, really neat, um, what we call the moving thumbnail feature, which basically meant that if you put your mouse over this little video screen, it would start to move. Um, you know, yeah. you've heard of this, you've seen this, we've all seen it on Instagram, on YouTube, on everything else. But until then, that didn't exist. So people would just have like a still 
and people have a little description next to it. And for, for many years, as in for decades, that's how video was done. And we said, no, that doesn't make any sense. You can't see what's going on. So we built this really cool system that would look at the overall video, try and pick out key scenes, and then essentially take a few screen grabs from those key scenes and animate those. So that you could, the idea being that you could very quickly get a sense of what was in the video. So like I say, I've got a patent on that. And, you know, Matt and I and a couple of our other engineers are on there. It's still proudly on my LinkedIn, I think. <laughs> Never made me a penny. And, and now, of course, is used by everybody else, many of whom have made much more out of it, I'm sure, than I have. But, but you know, we did that. I think we did that first. <laughs> yeah, because it's even like, for example, people watching this, right? They're going to yeah. probably hovered over the yeah. thumbnail before they watch that, right? Yeah. And it's just, like I said, it's now obvious to us. Yeah. But... At you have time. to do, somebody had to do it first, yeah, right? Exactly, exactly. I mean, the uh, analogous thing that has nothing to do with me is the whole closed captioning thing. You know, like I remember there was one point when we looked at the application of closed captioning, and because we, we, we had we built technology that could do the speech recognition and mm. and create a speech track, and we thought this is not really a very interesting business because actually there's only so much TV content where you have to have closed captioning. It's things like news mm. and so on, where there's some kind of public service, and so we th- and 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 we sort of thought that's there's it's not a very big market. Turns out it's now a massive market. It, right yeah. because so many of us watch so much video online in a place where we can't have the audio on so we're always staring at the text and you know if we'd just done that we'd probably built a bit bigger business and obviously you then exited that business right yeah and what was that transition like what was the process did it was some could you build the business hoping one day you'd be able to exit or yeah where did that opportunity come from yeah i think i mean again this is hard to sort of explain at this point because i think the whole vernacular and kind of methodology of startups is much more advanced and mature now but at the time there was no obvious outcome that we were aiming for it was kind of like build a thing do well at it hopefully make some money and so on and it was just like you know fight you know live to fight another day essentially or live to fight another week maybe at best and so that's what i did for close to a decade and we went through a crazy journey you know we were, you know we almost fell apart about three times. We did, you know, multiple acquisitions. We raised money multiple times. Uh, We took the company public. So I was a public CEO, which was a really interesting experience in itself uh, and so on. But I got to the point about, about eight years in where I just felt really quite tired. It wasn't like a sort of burnout. It wasn't like an overnight thing, but it was more a sort of, you know, I can just feel the fatigue. And when I look forward, I can see that I've got this job for years if I want it, just keep, keep on going. And I'll make a bit more each year and the company will get a bit bigger each year. But really, it's not going to change fundamentally. You know, there's not a big, there's not any big change that's going to happen. We weren't, you know, we hadn't built the next Apple or Google. It was a great business. It was a big business, but it wasn't, it was a billion dollar business, but not a $10 billion business or a hundred billion dollar business. And so, and I just sort of realized that that lack of creativity in the future was ultimately going to poison the whole thing for me. And so at that point, I talked to my board and said, look, I I don't need to quit right now, but I will quit at some point in the next zero to two, three years. So let's figure out how we do that. And so that was quite a hard, you know, thing to come to terms with. It was a really hard thing to communicate to various people, but, but I did do that. And then, and then there was a sort of transition period. And in the end, I handed it over to my my number two, and and he was a great CEO for a number of years after me. So the company continued on, and in fact, it still exists. It got merged with another one a few years later. But um, and I was on the board actually for probably five six years after I left. And then once you left that, right? Then yeah. you then obviously you've now gone into the venture capital world. Yeah. What was behind that transition, right? Because I think it's people hopefully one day who are listening to this might yeah. exit their business. Yeah. And they're gonna look at different options they have. Yeah. What made you go down the investment route rather than? going for like building more and more businesses yourself? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I hope people who listen to this or watch this do consider VC. You know, it definitely needs more people who are sort of not already VC insiders. It historically was a bit of a sort of job you did after you'd been a successful entrepreneur or been a successful mm-hmm. financier or whatever. Nowadays, actually, it's it's more professional. You can join VC, you know, pretty much out of university if you've got the right kind of stuff done at that point. Um, and you can certainly join a few years later and you can sort of become a career VC. And I think VC is is good for that. Like I think I think you need a mixture. You need people like me yeah. who've done something very different, but you also need people who've kind of done it as their stock and trade, you know, for many years. And certainly our firm has a mixture of both. In my case, I was kind of intrigued by it in a very high level from a distance, but I'd never really fully considered it as a big career choice. Uh, certainly not at that point in my life. I was sort of in my mid thirties, I guess, when I stepped down from Blinks. But I took a couple of years off after stopping down from the CEO job just to sort of recuperate a little bit. And my wife was super busy at the time. So it was quite nice to sort of balance things out with her job going on. And so I did that for a while. And in that period, you know, we, we looked at like, well, what do we do next with our lives? And, and a couple of things happened. First of all, we said, let's move back to Europe and to the UK in particular. And as part of that, I started talking to people in the tech industry here. And that led me to my now firm, Balderton, uh, and one of the partners. And he had had a similar sort of story. He'd also grown up in Europe, uh, in his case, in France, 
built a business, gone to Silicon Valley, taken it public there, and then come back to be a VC. And he said, look, I've loved this second journey of mine. You sh- I think you would too. And he convinced me, basically. And he was right. I mean, you know, nine years later, I, I love my job and I wouldn't, you know, change it for anything. So, you know, your other part of the question was, why not do more companies? And I think it's a very personal choice thing. You know, I, I loved building a company. I can imagine doing it again, maybe. But I do know that especially if you want to build a high value, fast scaling, you know, venture style business, which is what I would do, then it's really hard work. And it requires a level of commitment and obsession that gets you through irrationally challenging times. It's really, really hard. And and to do all of that, you need to have an idea. So for now, that's not the right thing for me. I, I like what the point you made there as well, because I think sometimes there is a kind of glamorization of the hustle culture. Yeah. And like, go, if things are hard, still go for it no matter what. Yeah. But I think, like you said, it's got to be because you love what you're doing so much. Yeah. That you're willing to do that. Yeah. Whereas if you're just doing that just so you prove a point. Yeah. I think that's sometimes that adjustment needs to be made and people need to think about is like if you're only working the long hours because you want to tell people I'm working 16 hour days, I'm doing this. Yeah. It shouldn't be the state is the hard work. It should be the state is I'm making this impact. This is what I'm changing. Here's how I'm making like why I really care about what I do. Yeah. But is it was interesting when you said about you moved, you decided to move back to Europe. Yeah. Why why did you make that decision? Because obviously America, the Silicon Valley space is a lot more mature than yeah. UK yeah, scene. yeah. Two reasons. One was family and the other was, I think, the fact that we're quite entrepreneurial. So the family reason was an obvious one. Uh, we'd had two little kids while we were out in California and we could sort of tell that they were just not going to get to know their grandparents and their, you know, um, aunts and uncles and cousins and so mm-hmm. on. Both my family and my wife's family are here in the UK, in different parts of the UK. So we sort of thought it would be nice for them, particularly while they're young, mm-hmm. to sort of know that. But then the second reason was that we came and spent a bit of time back in Europe and we, you know, she's a biotech person and we realized that that the UK in particular, but Europe in general, was sort of where we had been in the US about 10 years behind. And there was a real opportunity to kind of join that ecosystem quite early, hopefully have an impact, hopefully make a difference, share some of the things that we'd learned and just enjoy being part of that ride again, you know, because it's very different. I mean, at that point, 2013, 2014, Silicon Valley was in full swing. I mean, it turned out that would go on for another five, six, seven years. But even at the time, it felt pretty peaky, you know. And, yeah. and so we were like, this has been great. But how about going back to what it was like when it was scrappy again? And and Britain felt really quite like that at that point. You know, we were, we were just beginning to like, you know, start to create some billion dollar companies and all that kind of stuff. And you know, now there are whatever, tens, if not, you know, 100 of them or whatever. So, so I think that 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 was just a great moment in time to do all those things. And that's why we why we came back. On the point you made earlier, so I wanted to pick up on that, this thing about people working hard, I, I couldn't agree more, basically. I, I did work really, really hard. And I think to be a successful founder, especially of one of these high growth companies, th- there will be times when you will have to work harder than anyone really ought to work. And there will be stress that really is 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 kind of an unpleasant level of stress. However, there is this really in my opinion, immature mentality around just do more time, just do more hours. Um, You know, the kind of like, I take a sleeping bag into work every day. You know, if you need to take a sleeping bag into work once or twice because you really have to that particular day, sure, that's the dedication. But if you're bragging about it, there's something wrong, in my opinion. Um, And and my firm is pretty obsessed with this idea. So we launched a thing, you know, recently that we call the Bulletin, the Bulletin Founder Performance and Wellbeing Platform. And it's basically a platform to help founders think about the fact that the journey they're on is going to be hard, but it's a long term journey. So it's incredibly short sighted to just, you know, Mm -hmm. burn the candle at both ends constantly from day one. If you do that, you'll basically just burn out at some point. And that's not good for you. But it's also not good for the business or for your investors frankly you know we're in it yeah. to make money and for you, for us to make money you need to be in it for 10 years or, or more because that's how long it takes and so you know we're trying to create this whole thing around let's talk more about that and you know it's 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 not a new idea for other fields right if you talk to sports people professional sports people they don't you know if they're a sprinter they don't sprint every day they have rest days you know they have day they think about their diet they think about their family they think about their mental well-being and so on and so Hopefully the industry can start to introduce some of that thinking. Um, you know, we're going to kick it off with some of this stuff that we're doing, but I hope it, I hope it spreads, as you said. Like as you've been like investing in so many companies now, right? What have you seen as like one of the things which maybe people listening who are trying to raise capital or they should be thinking about differently or like maybe a common, I guess, misunderstanding a lot of people have about building companies and you're trying to change that mentality or the way they think about it beyond just the burnout side of things. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that is an important point. So we should, you know, that's definitely one that's good that we talked about that already. I think, I think the biggest thing that I see is around getting the sort of long-term, short-term balance right. And and it's a really hard thing to do because there's no single one answer to it, the the question, if if, if I'm honest, but, but um, there are many, many 
companies that get very, very hooked on short term tricks that have worked for them well. So, you know, various growth hacks or, you know, a particular PR narrative that's worked well in the press or whatever it might be. Um, and and that's great. And and actually that that initial kickstart can really help you. But at the same time, you've got to be building underneath all of that something that's strategic and that's long term. Now, equally, there are other companies we meet who seem to spend, you know, five years building this amazing magical platform and never getting it out there. And then when they finally turn up, um, they've now got three months, you know, funding left to sort of make it work. And of course, the first customer has an issue with it and it just falls apart and then it's all over. And I think the best companies know how to marry the two. One of our portfolio companies is, uh, is Revolut, which is obviously fairly well-known uh, neobank here in the UK. And Revolut's a great example of this. We, we led their seed and their series A rounds. And so we've known them for a very long time since Vlad and Nikolai started the business and just two of them at the time. And they did have one of those growth hacks in the early days. You know, Nick, Nick was really obsessed with this idea of, yeah, if you're someone like me, a sort of somewhat international European kind of person, you're traveling around, you just know you're getting ripped off. Every time you go abroad and you use your card, like you just get ripped off by your bank. And we just want to change that. And I think that if I change that, like people like me will tell other people like me. And he was absolutely right. There was this initial upswell and that gave them amazing, very early traction. But they didn't they didn't just get hooked on that. You know, they realized that for this to be a really interesting, really big business, they had to appeal to other people that had other problems. He was very self-aware that, you know, yeah. he was an ex-trader at, at, you know, I forget which bank, you know, in, in Canary Wharf. There weren't that many of him. Like if you built a business just for people like him, it wasn't gonna be that interesting. And so, you know, in behind the scenes, while they absolutely milked that word of mouth uh, growth for every bit it was worth. They also built a much more strategic, much more long-term roadmap about all the mm. other things they would layer in. Some of which seemed almost farcically long-term at the time, you know, because you yeah. saw in guys, you're like five of you, you know, in a tiny room somewhere in, you know, in London, like feverishly working away at this. And why are you planning a roadmap, which in six years might have a whole wealth management platform? That seems a bit over the top, yeah. but actually, you know, X years later, they do have a wealth management platform. It's one of the biggest ones in on the country, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I think having that balance is critical. And I, I see a lot of companies that either are too perfectionist, so they'd spend for ages planning everything and you've got to get it out there. You've got to get people using it and telling you what works and what doesn't work. And you get the flip side, which is someone getting a bit too caught up with something that's worked well for them and forgetting that in the end, this is about building a lasting, enduring business. And that means it's going to be bigger than just one trick. I think we've run out of time now. Okay. So I'm going to jump to the quick fire questions. Yeah. But I could talk all day. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was really good. Thank you. Um, the first one is who are three British Asian entrepreneurs that you'd love to shout out that you think the audience should be paying attention to? Well, let me do, because we're on, a big, given given the topic, I'll, I'll do three British Asians. That's all right. And the three I'm going to pick, not all entrepreneurs, 100%, but um, one is Simon Aurora, who is the, the CEO of B&M, who I just think is a really low profile person for what he's achieved. You know, he is very, very smart, very analytical, very strategic guy. I don't know him, yeah. but I've watched him build uh, B&M from, you know, a really tiny business into an absolutely huge one, which is, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people talk about online commerce and online retail, but the, the sort of discounter market, which he has been at the forefront of, is almost as big and grown almost as fast. In fact, faster, I think, in the last few years. Anyway, so just for me, one of these people who just keeps his head down, works really hard, but has actually built an incredible business employing thousands of people. The second British Asian I would nominate is my mum, if that's all right. Um, so, you know, to me, she is a great example of the sort of, you know, in ingenuity and kind of energy that that's so important. And also, frankly, a reflection of the opportunity that this country certainly gave my family, which is that, you know, she when she first moved to the UK, she was 19 years old, just got married to my dad, very, very young, didn't have a lot of education, but was smart and was ambitious. Unsurprisingly for a woman of her age, uh, of her era and generation who was Asian, who was that young, she spent the first X years of her marriage, you know, bringing up me and my brother, um, but she always wanted to do more. And then she, so she went and did loads of courses, learned English properly, went to university, became a teacher, ended up becoming an advisor to teaching schools all over Manchester where I grew up. And, you know, just very inspiring from that point of view. Like I say, both her, her own energy and efforts, but also the fact that, you know, she lived in a place where that was possible, which wouldn't mm -hmm. have been possible had she, you know, stayed in Sri Lanka, for example. I think. And the third Asian that I'll that I'll nominate is is RPM Rishi Sunak. You know, Rishi's funny because I don't I don't share a lot with him in many ways. I mean, you know, he went to the finest schools in our country. I went to the local comp. You know, he and I probably don't see eye to eye on a bunch of political things. However, I still think it's really inspiring that he has the job that he has and that he's doing it the way that he's doing it. And you know, yeah, I'm certainly not above or beyond sort of respecting that and you know congratulating him for that and i think it's just a really important role model for 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 people that you know like you and i grew up here 
uh, to see that actually, you know, whatever you want to do and wherever you want to be and whatever kind of job you want, there's an opportunity and that people are out there doing it. Yeah, I agree in terms of like, I think sometimes we get caught up in the details, whereas at the end of the day, if somebody is able to do that, it just shows, okay, there is space for everybody at the top there. Yeah. And the next question is, if people listening right now could like reach out to like follow you or follow Borderton, where should they go to, to find out more about what you're doing? Oh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, they're more than welcome to connect or follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, That's probably the easiest thing to do. You know, if you are an entrepreneur and you have a company you'd like to talk about, then feel free to email me, saranga.balderton.com. I may not be the right person in the firm to look to talk to you because I look at certain areas, but happy to bounce you to whomever is the right person. And if you're interested in the firm, generally, you should sign up for our mailing list, which you can just do on our website. And that's particularly good because that will have announcements of events that we hold. And although we do a lot of stuff for our own portfolio of companies we've invested in, because we have a great office in in King's Cross in London, we actually do a lot of events just that are generally open to anyone who's interested. So whether it's a particular area of tech, like AI, whether it's a particular kind of job, like how to get into tech from finance or whatever, we have, you know, probably about 50 or 60 events a year that you can come along to and, and be part of. So hopefully between all of that, should be able to find the thing that works for you. And then on the other side, is there anything you need help with right now with that border team you've helped with? Um, oh, that's very nice of you. Um, I, know. I mean, look, I think just what I just said already said. I mean, you know, in the end, our job is to invest in, back, believe and, you know, enable amazing entrepreneurs and founders from all over Europe to build great technology companies. We don't back every kind of company. We back companies that have tech at their core and we back companies that want to take on you know, venture investment from people like us to grow rapidly and unprofitably at first to build ultimately a really large business. It's about taking a lot of risk and it's about trying to go for something really, really large. Uh, If you are one of those people, we'd love to talk to you. And so thank you again so much for coming on. Thank you. Have you got any final words to the audience? No, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for having me here. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. It means a huge amount to us. And we don't think you realise how important you are. Because if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, if you leave us a five-star review, it makes a world of difference. And if you believe in what we're trying to do here, to inspire, connect and guide the next generation British Asians, if you do those things, you can help us achieve that mission. And you can help us make a bigger impact. And by doing that, it means we can get bigger guests, we can host more events, we can do more for the community. So you can play a huge part. So thank you so much for supporting us.